Welcome to the next in a series of webinars brought to you by PKF Texas. We were pleased to welcome directors Nicole Riley and Emily Smichael to discuss 2021 accounting and tax updates and changes for not-for-profits. This presentation was recorded live on August 25, 2021 as a Zoom webinar. All information was accurate and current at that time. Those viewing this recording now are not eligible to receive CPE credit from PKF Texas. If you have questions regarding this or future webinars, please feel free to email us at jlemansky at pkftexas.com and we will get back to you as soon as possible. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for attending. Welcome to our 2021 accounting and tax update and changes for not-for-profits. Uh, Nicole and Emily are happy to answer any questions during the seminar or there will be a Q&A afterwards. There is a, a Q&A button at the bottom of the, of the uh, page and so just hit that at the bottom of your screen and you'll be able to uh, ask any question you want and make sure you let us know which one you would like to answer uh, those questions. So Nicole Riley and Emily Smichael are our presenters today and it's my pleasure to introduce them. Nicole is an audit director here at PKF Texas and one of the leaders of our not-for-profit team. She's been providing uh, audit and consulting service for the not-for-profit community for 14 years. Nicole works closely with management and the board of directors of her clients in meeting reporting requirements and providing value and helping them become more effective and efficient in their mission. Emily Smichael is a tax director here at PKF Texas and also one of the leaders of our not-for-profit team. Emily's experience includes a broad exposure to a variety of tax areas, including federal, state, and local, corporate, partnerships and trust, uh, estate and gift, individual compliance and consulting. Her focus is on serving not-for-profit organizations along with high net worth individuals. Emily also helps with our recruiting and a, a variety of other uh, training and initiatives at the firm. We appreciate our efforts on that. And so without further ado, Emily, will you get us started? Absolutely, good morning. Thank you all for joining us. We are very excited that, that you're taking some time of your morning. We really were hoping to do this in person and, and be together, but unfortunately COVID had other plans. So we are still thankful for technology and glad that you're here with us. But we are keeping our fingers crossed that next time we do one of these, We'll all be in the same room together, so stay posted for that. So to get us started, just a couple of quick disclaimers. First of all, anything shared today is the opinion of Nicole or myself, not of the firm. And also, please do not duplicate these materials today without our permission. And we are going to start off with a polling question. So because we can't see all of your faces, we want to get a feel for who is joining us today. So for this first polling question, let us know what is your position within your not-for-profit organization? We'll give you a little bit to answer that. And as Byron said already, there are a few of these polling questions throughout today, and you will need to respond to them in order to get CPE credit if you are looking for that. Okay, so we have about 60% executive team members, we've got a few board members and service providers. So got a good mix today. Great. All right, so I'm going to kick us off with some tax law first thing this morning. I'm gonna be talking about some current tax laws, some extra relief under the CARES Act and some things to look out for that could be coming down the pike with the Biden administration. And let me start off with saying, I am under no false illusion that any one of you woke up this morning super excited to hear about tax law first thing in the morning. I get it, like I'm paid to learn about tax law and it's a struggle for me first thing in the morning. So my goal is to be clear, to uh, make it relevant to you, to help you understand why it's important to you and to your organization. But if at any point during this, you want some more clarity, if you have any questions, feel free to put a message in the question box and I will do my best to answer that. So I'm primarily gonna be talking about tax laws surrounding the deduction for charitable contributions. And why does that matter to you as, as an organization? Well, of course it's important for donors to understand their tax implications, 
for giving, but also as the hopeful recipient of those donations, which is primarily what we have on the call today, it's important for you to know the tax implications to the donors for a couple of reasons. One is so that you can understand maybe part of their motivation behind giving, and two, so that you can help educate them on the tax benefits of giving. So my goal today is to hopefully give you some talking points, help educate you on some of these current rules, and then again, kind of some things to keep an eye out for com coming down the pike. So let's get started and talk about current, some of the current tax laws for individual taxpayers around charitable contributions. So I'm gonna discuss these in sections. First, I'm going to talk about the current laws without the additional benefits of the CARES Act. And then I'll talk about what was added on for the CARES Act. So first, individuals must itemize their deductions rather than take the standard deduction in order to get the benefit of their charitable contribution. And then due to the Tax Reform Act of 2017, the adjusted gross income limitation, I'll just say AGI limitation going forward, it was increased from 50% to 60% for cash contributions by individuals to public charities. So what this means is individuals can get a deduction for their charitable contributions for up to 60% of their AGI. And remember that I said this is for cash contributions to public charities. Primarily today, those are the type of contributions I'm going to be talking about. And the reason I'm specifying it is because there are different roles for non-cash contributions and for contributions to private foundations. And we just don't have the time to get into all the different roles today. But I will say that for contributions to public charities of non-cash items, the amount that can be deducted is limited to 30 to 50% of a taxpayer's AGI, depending on what the type of property it is. And then when the AGI deduction limit is exhausted, no matter if it's the 30 or the 50 or the 60% limitation, the individual can carry over any excess contribution deduction for the next five years. One item that I want to point out because it's relevant now, but it could be even more relevant in the future, which I'll hit on again in just a little bit. But there is a great benefit to taxpayers to donate appreciated stock. It's a very attractive option for donors. And it's for two reasons. One, they get a deduction for the appreciated fair market value rather than the lower cost basis. And two, they do not have to pay capital gains tax on that appreciation. So it's really a win-win for taxpayers. And again, I'll talk about in a little bit why it could be even more of a win in the future, in the near future. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the CARES Act add-on. So due to the spread of COVID-19, Congress has taken steps for, to provide additional incentives to taxpayers to contribute to public charities. These special provisions that we're talking about are applicable for the 2020 and 2021 tax years. So first, for individuals who do not itemize, the CARES Act adds a deduction for qualified charitable contributions for up to $300. So even if an individual takes a standard deduction rather than itemizing, they are still eligible to get up to a $300 deduction for qualified contributions. And then probably the, the bigger item is that Congress temporarily suspended that 60% AGI limitation that we just spoke about for cash contributions made to qualifying organizations. For these two years, 2020 and 2021, individuals may itemize, who itemize can uh, deduct up to 100% of their contrib contribution base. So it allows more of a deduction for those individuals. For corporate, the laws for corporations around charitable contributions, a little less complex, unfortunately, also a little less generous. But the general charitable contribution deduction for corporations is limited to 10% of their taxable income. That's determined without NOL and other certain special deductions. 
but similar to an individual taxpayer, they also have a five-year carryover when, once their threshold is met in which they can still use the excess deduction. And what the CARES Act did for corporate taxpayers, they increased that 10% threshold to 25%. So for 2020 and 2021, the CARES Act increased the deduction limitation to 25% of taxable income for corporate taxpayers. All right, so we've talked about some of the current laws. We've talked about some of the CARES Act add-ons. Now let's talk about some of the proposed changes that could be coming in the near future and how they could affect the landscape of charitable giving going forward. So first I wanna say that we certainly understand that if a taxpayer is not already charitably inclined, then a change in tax law is probably not gonna make a huge difference for them. We always like to say the tail won't wag the dog. It's just, if that's not already something that's important to them, these changes won't rock the boat too much. However, some of Biden's tax proposals certainly make giving more attractive. So I want to talk about what some of those could be. It's also very important for me to note that at this point, none of these changes are 100% certain. They are purely proposals. The American Families Plan is a proposal from the Biden administration. So it's essentially just a wish list at this point. None of it has been passed. So we, we will probably have more updates once anything is actually passed. But right now, let's talk about what could be coming down the pike. So first, the highest individual tax rates could increase. What does that mean for you? What well, would make offsetting deductions for those individuals worth more? So they'd be incentivized to make more contributions. In the same vein, corporate tax rates could increase, which would make corporate de deductions for their charitable contributions worth more. Another important note here is that if the corporate tax rates increase, this would also increase the tax rate for unrelated business income for nonprofit entities. On our last webinar, we dove a little bit more into unrelated business income. We can always share that link if, if you want to rewatch that. But right now, if your organization has unrelated business income, that's taxed at 21%. However, the proposed plan for corporate tax rates is to go up to 25 to 28%. So that, again, that's also applicable to not-for-profit entities, UBI. Another big thing that's being talked about is capital gains rates. So right now, there is a favorable tax rate associated with capital gains that is lower than ordinary tax rates. This could be going away for certain taxpayers, which would even further incentivize the donation of appreciated stock. Remember, we just talked about how great of an option that is for them. And so now if the capital gains rate is raised to the higher ordinary rate, that's even more reason for them to want to donate that appreciated stock maybe versus cash. And then another significant item in the proposed plan is related to estate taxes. So the proposal is to tax capital gains at death for unrealized gains above $1 million. So let me give a quick summary of the current estate tax rules. So right now, items pass to beneficiaries at the stepped up value at the decedent's date of death. And then if and when the beneficiary sells the property, their basis is that stepped up value from the date of death rather than the likely much lower original basis of the decedent, resulting in less taxable gain. If you've got a higher basis, that means less gain. And then one key point here is that there actually is no capital gain if they don't actually sell the property. Until they sell it, no gain is triggered. That's the current rule. President Biden's proposed plan would change that and it would tax assets as if sold when someone dies. In other words, even if the beneficiary doesn't sell the property, there will be unrealized gains that will trigger taxes upon the owner's death minus the million dollar exemption. So again, we are talking about significant capital gains here. 
But this coupled with the plan to tax capital gains at the higher ordinary rates would be particularly important for families that have a lot of appreciated real estate, appreciated stock. So we could see this triggering many more donations of appreciated assets to charity versus cash in order to try to bypass this tax on capital gains. And with that in mind, we also wanna point out the importance of your organization having a gift acceptance policy in place. Even if these rules, these proposed rules don't get passed, it's good governance to have a gift acceptance policy in place. Why? Because your organization doesn't want to accept gifts that are more hassle, more time, more money than the gifts themselves are worth. Nicole, do you wanna maybe chime in a little here from your perspective on those gift acceptance policies? Yeah, on the book side of things, when we're recording uh, the accept, when you accept a gift from a donor, you have to accept it at its fair value. And that can be, it's really easy for stock because that's tr daily traded and you can turn around and sell it and you know what the value was the day that it was received. So appreciated stock is very attractive for, a, for an organization. But having a gift acceptance policy is really important because if you are receiving oil paintings or horses or land, and that is not in your wheelhouse and that is not within what your organization does, trying to, for example, receiving horses, if you're not in that space and trying to have to pay for the upkeep and trying to sell a horse, that could really take a lot of resources and energy from within your organization away from your mission and away from what you're trying to do and also cost you more money than the gift itself is going to provide. So be having a gift acceptance policy in hand allows management to say no politely and graciously um, without offending a donor. Right, so important now, probably even more important in the future. Thank you, Nicole. So there are a couple of noteworthy items that didn't actually even make it into the proposed American Families Plan, but they were discussed in Biden's campaign proposals. So who knows, they could still be a factor at some point during this administration. So for that reason, I want to point them out because they could move the needle a bit in either direction for charitable giving. One of these items negatively, one of them positively. So let's talk about the potential negative movement first. So P's limitations, which essentially reduce itemized deductions for high income taxpayers, they were eliminated by the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Biden proposed restoring these as well as putting a cap on itemized deductions at 28% for certain taxpayers, taxpayers whose income exceeds $400,000. So unfortunately, this could serve to disincentivize affluent individuals from giving above and beyond their cap. One item that may incentivize more giving is a potential change to the taxable estate threshold. So, Quick summary of the current standing. The Tax Reform Act of 2017 doubled the basic estate tax exclusion. So for example, in 2020, only estates valued at greater than 11.58 million will be subject to estate tax. This exclusion currently is set to go through 2025 and then to sunset back to an approximate 5.8 million. Again, while not invited proposed American Family Plan, his campaign platform did propose to accelerate this reduction and lower the exemption to only 3.5 million. So if that passed, that would bring the taxable estate threshold from 11.58 million to 3.5 million, which would obviously cause many more taxable estates. With that potential lower threshold, it's projected that charitable bequests would increase in order to create charitable deductions against the value of the estate, and also could very well increase more uh, lifetime giving in order to avoid having the high-valued estate at time of death. 
So that was a lot of tax information there. And hopefully it gives you some talking points to talk with your donors, your potential donors. But we always want to remind you that while it's important, these tax benefits, sure, it's important. Really, the main concern of most affluent donors is whether or not their dollar will make a difference. So while I noted earlier, sure, these, these changes in tax laws, they may incentivize giving to some degree, but that's not typically the primary motivator. So I just always like to remind you to make sure, make it very clear to your donors and prospective donors what difference their dollar will make with your organization. And then these tax deductions, they're just an added benefit, important benefit, but an added benefit. So we're gonna switch gears a little bit and do another polling question right quick. Let us know, did your organization receive any of the following? A PPP loan, an employee retention credit, both, neither, or you don't know. And you may recall when these first came out in early 2020, the, the rule was that you could only do one or the other. So most people chose the PPP loan, but then later in the year, they came back and said, actually, you can do both and they made it retroactive. So, all right, so we've got about 45% that did the PPP loan, 13% did both, okay. So the majority did something. All right, what, what I expected to see after the year that we had. So before I pass it over to Nicole to talk about some things on the financial reporting side of things, I wanna to quickly touch on a couple items that are likely to be relevant to most of your organizations soon if, if they aren't already related to the PPP loan and the employee retention credit. I'm gonna explain how you can expect to see these reported on the form 990. So let's first talk about the PPP loan forgiveness. Per the instructions for Form 990, not-for-profit organizations may report forgiven PPP loan amounts as contribution income from government units in the tax year when the loans are actually forgiven. So until it's actually forgiven on your Form 990, it will remain reported as a liability. And then in the year that you actually receive the official forgiveness, it will be shown as contribution income. This varies from gap purposes for your financial reporting. So Nicole, can you fill us in a little bit on what it looks like on that end? Nonprofits for the PPP loan actually have two options for PPP loan recording. You can follow contribution guidance which is 958-605 guidance, or you can follow debt guidance and do debt forgiveness when it's actually forgiven. That, if you went with debt forgiveness, it would follow 990 contribution, uh, 990 reporting and be reported as income in the year it's forgiven, but it would be shown as debt forgiveness, not contributions. Most of my clients are going with the contribution guidance recording, which means at the time that the conditions have been met, which most of the time means you've spent the money in accordance with the rules and that you're reasonably assured that the amounts would be forgiven. And the reason for that is it really does follow, the, that kind of follows the way that organizations record grants, like cost reimbursement grants. So on a cost reimbursement grant, as they spend the money, they record the income and expense at the same time. Most of my clients are following that guidance and that's usually happening within 2020 because the eight week and the 24 week periods ended in 2020 and most are going to, um, going to have contribution revenue for those PPP loans in 2020. So again, it could result in showing the income in different years on your financials versus your Form 990. In fact, Nicole and I have already seen this on a few of our 2020 clients. The, audit, the audited financial statements show it as 2020 income, but on the 2020 990, we are still showing it as a liability. And 
hopefully 2021 will be the year that it will be shown as income. I just wanted to point that out to you as you may see a difference and wonder why. That's why. Let's also talk a little bit about the employee retention credit. We saw that several of you guys took advantage of this. This credit, you actually aren't going to be able to see it shown separately on Form 990 because it's not to be shown as an income item. Instead, it will be a reduction of payroll tax expense. So if you're just skimming the 990, you won't see any breakout line of this employee retention credit. It's just gonna be a reduction of that payroll tax ex expense. So with that, you have survived the tax talk of the day. Thanks for sticking with me and I'm gonna turn it over to Nicole now to take it from here. All right. And I'm gonna throw another wrench at you guys. Um, I know we, we threw tax first, even though it was accounting tax in the, in the title. And I'm gonna actually start with changes in auditing standards, not changes in accounting, primarily because this is really going to, you're gonna see the effects of these changes pretty significantly within, if you have an audit report, or if you are someone that reads audit reports and uses financial statements. First and foremost, the audit report is going to change. It hasn't really substantially changed in the last 15 years, to my knowledge. I think we added some headers, but really have not had any significant changes in those years. But we are going to have a little bit different layout, first and foremost. So if we go to the next slide, this is an example of what the current audit report looks like. As you can see, there's a little intro, then there's management's responsibility, auditor's responsibility, a little bit longer, two paragraphs, and then the opinion is way down at the bottom. The first thing you're gonna notice when we go to the next slide, and this is the new, what the new audit opinion is gonna look like under these new standards. And then you can see the audit opinion is right there at the top. And it's gonna be right, uh, the big thing here is transparency. The uh, standards want to make sure that we're not hiding anything and we're making, and everybody's really is most concerned with the opinion when they look at an audit opinion. So it makes sense to put that right there at the top because that's really what you're most concerned about. Then you kind of have, you have a basis of opinion which has a little bit ex more explanation um, on the standards that were followed to come to the opinion. And then you, again, you have management's responsibilities. And if you flip to the next slide, Jen, we're gonna see, this is what the auditor's responsibilities portion looks like. So our opinion is gonna go from probably one page to two pages now. I don't think it's gonna fit on one page going forward. And as you can see, the auditor's responsibilities becomes much more detailed, get some bullet points, uh, all in the effort to be transparent and provide more information to the users of the financial statements. For those of you that are involved with public companies, have ever seen a public company audit report opinion, this actually looks a little bit more like a public company report with the opinion at the top um, and it follows the PCAOB by putting it up there. The other, another item that's going to be pretty different, well, a little bit different, um, hopefully no one on this call actually has to deal with this, but if you have substantial doubt or going concern opinion, and that is when the organization is, it looks like they're not gonna be able to make it through the next 12 months. So if you're having cash flow problems, um, really highly leveraged organizations that we call those going concerns where we're, we don't think they're gonna be able to make the next 12 months of operations historically and under current, oh, excuse me, under current rules, we would just have a paragraph after the opinion that said other matters and it would describe what's going on in the paragraph. Going forward, we are now gonna to have to title that substantial doubt about the entity's ability to go as continue as a going concern. It's gonna be very black and white and it's, you're not gonna be able, it's not gonna be hidden in any way. It's gonna be pretty in your face that there is a going concern opinion going on. The last thing I wanted to point out that is changing under these audit standards is they created 
CAMs, which are key audit matters. Not to be confused, the public companies actually have CAMs as well, but they are CAMs. They call them critical audit matters. Actually very similar at the end of the day, but just a, just a different acronym and different words. Key audit matters are going to be things that are most significant that need to be communicated with the board. And from an audit perspective, those are going to be things that have some significant audit risk, a lot of judgment involved, can be very complex, can have a lot of um, estimates in developing them. And specific examples would be if there was a goodwill impairment, if you have financial instruments that have a lot of complexity or estimation in, in, in determining their fair value, uh, especially if you have to use the lifespan of a person, an estimated lifespan and different estimates on returns in the market. Those are gonna be obviously things that have a lot of complexity and judgment involved and would most likely be considered a CAM. Revenue recognition can also get included here because there can be some significant estimates in when to recognize revenue, depending on the type of revenue that you have. And especially like litigation is another one that we would we would come into this play or come into play here. If you ha have a litigation that you think there's an estimated loss, obviously there's a lot of judgment involved in estimating what you would settle a litigation for. But most importantly, you only, the, the organization actually gets to choose whether or not they want the audit firm to report on these CAMs. So the organ, we will only include CAMs in the audit report if we're engaged to do so. Now, if the organization does elect to engage us for those, it is the auditor's discretion and a judgment as to what those CAMs will be, but the organization itself actually gets to choose. I've sat in some different trainings. I attended the AICPA Now for Profit Conference. Um, the overall consensus that we're seeing is that most, most auditors think that we're only going to be engaged to report on these CAMs for organizations that are pretty large, um, have complex matters going on, organizations that have board members that sit on the boards of public companies or work in public companies, um, or organizations that operate more like a public company because obviously there's gonna be more work involved uh, for the audit firm. We're gonna to have to document, we're gonna to have to consider it, it has to be reviewed, we have to do the reporting and the wording. So there's gonna be a little bit more cost involved. I don't see this as something that many of my organizations are going to want to do. The board um, is pretty close. We, I present at a lot of my nonprofit board meetings, we present the financial statements, we discuss all the, the things that went on during the audit. Um, so probably not something many of our clients are actually going to want to do, but because it is new and because it is at the discretion of the organization, it's something that we're going to have to talk about. So if you're a client of mine um, coming up, that'll be something we'll be reaching out for. And if you have a different audit firm, most likely they will be discussing this with you as well, because you're going to have to make that decision. Important to know, this is for 2021 year ends, that they're gonna be the first ones that are gonna to have to implement this new standard. Um, let's take our first, or my first polling question, the last polling question, and do does your organization receive donated items or services? Um, and why we let everybody pop that answer in. Uh, Emily, there was a question that came up. Um, maybe you can answer it why we're, we're letting everybody answer this polling question. Can you offset expenses used for PPP loan qualification at the time of reaching spending levels instead of showing as income for gap purposes? Oh, that's a question for me, actually. Um, 
In gap reporting, PPP loan is going to show as income and the related expenses will be shown as expenses. There would not be netting of the amounts um, and you would have, it would be a gross amount and, and would show in both, both areas. All right. And accidentally entered my phone. Forgot to put it on do not disturb. Uh, as we can see, oh, 59%. Good. Most of us have donated items or services going on that so this next piece is going to be very relevant um, so our next our next topic here is is it going to counting standards so this gets back into gap this is what you have to do for your audited financial statements and the important thing to know here is that this is the presentation and disclosure of non contributed non-financial assets or aka donated stuff um, donated services medical equipment pharmaceuticals clothing food land building equipment free rent also is included under this standard um, and the other item that many um, forget about is auction items so your silent and live auctions uh, that if you get items donated to you to you for those, they would be encompassed under this new standard. Emily talked a little bit about donated stock. Donated stock is specifically not included under the standard because it is a financial asset and most organizations are able to monetize that pretty quickly and easily. I always am interested in the why behind things sometimes and it's interesting, I just kind of an interesting story, I think. And the reason this standard came about was because of concerns over organizations increasing revenue and program expenses for things that they were receiving, inherently increasing, looking, making them look a lot larger, look more efficient because their program expenses were more than, um, and that in inherently made their management in general and their fundraising percentages look smaller and specifically it was all around pharmaceutical donations because u.s companies were donating pharmaceuticals and organizations that could not be sold in the u.s but they were the organizations themselves were using u.s wholesale markets as the basis for their fair value and we all know that pharmaceuticals here in the u.s are quite a bit more expensive than they are in other parts of the world so if an organization is receiving these pharmaceuticals and then using them in other countries where they can be utilized, uh, the, the values could be vastly different. And the first thing to know is that the how you record them and what we are recording for fair value is not changing. We still have to sh follow fair value measurement rules within other parts of GAP. So the how you record and what value you put on them is not changing at all. It's only how we are presenting them in the financials and the disclosures that we are providing. And it's all about enhanced transparency, giving more information to the readers of the financial statements so they know what you, how you valued and what you how um, and what you received. So first and foremost, you're going to put the in-kind donations on the uh, face of your statement of activities. A lot of, some organizations already do this, so this might not look any different for you, but if you include your donated items in just your contribution lines, you now have to break those out and have two separate ones. You're gonna have just contributions, which is cash and financial assets, and then in-kind contributions as a separate line item. Most of the other changes are in the disclosures. So really enhancing and saying a lot about something that really was probably maybe a paragraph in the past is gonna possibly be an entire page of footnotes now. And if you flip to the next slide here real quick, um, we're gonna have to do a disaggregation by category, which means we have to have a table that it has each category of uh, not or of non-financial assets received included and listed and that's going to tie back to your statement of activities and then for each of those categories that you have <clears throat> excuse me we have to include a lot of qualitative information and in whether you sell them monetize them or use them internally 
your policy for monetizing them instead of using them, uh, whether there's donor imposed restrictions and all the valuation techniques, inputs, the principal markets that you used in, in the valuation techniques, a lot of information is gonna be included on these donated uh, items. It is effective. So our June 30th year ends of 2022, you guys are gonna be the first ones that have to implement this. But what I wanna stress right now is it has to be retrospectively implemented, which means in our 2022 report, you have to have the 2021 information too. So we have to be tracking it now because all of what's going on right now will have to be reported and included in the, in the report next year. So if you don't have a good tracking system right now, and if you don't already do this, it'd be a good time to look at your policies and your procedures to get something implemented. If you don't have a policy around monetizing versus utilizing in-kind um, donations, again, a good time to get that in place. So once it comes time to disclose the policy, you have one. Um, and this could also be right around your gift, pol gift acceptance policy that Emily mentioned earlier and can wrap into that. Uh, and um, I wanted to show you a couple examples because I'm really, I, I'm a more visual person myself, but wanted to show you here, here's what the the quantitative, like the numbers itself, the by category would look like. And as you can see here, you know, medical equipment, auction, rent, nursing services, the services, donated services also fall under this category. So if nursing services are qualified where nurses come and provide their services and you would have to pay for them otherwise, um, accountants, legal, those are also sometimes where we see donated services. And then if you would go to the next slide, you can see it's a lot of words. And that first paragraph is only the information about the contributed medical equipment and supplies. And then if we go to the next slide, it's a whole paragraph on the auction items and then another paragraph just on the in-kind rent. And so you have to have a paragraph and information about each category. I wanna also point out, I am a member of the non for profit section with the AICPA. And these come directly from their sample footnotes that they have, uh, the sample non-for-profit footnotes, and they have sample non-for-profit financial statements. So if anybody is looking for some examples of footnotes, I would, if you please reach out to me, I'd be happy to provide those samples um, back to you and give you some information. Uh, we have a couple of questions on this standard specifically. So let me, on ASU 2027, is there any materiality standard to avoid a long explanatory footnote for small value items relative to total contributions? I think there very much in an audit, we do use materiality uh, for, or if, if things are relatively small, you could probably have an other and a general a general footnote um, if they are in there most likely if you for example if you have two million dollars in contributions and ten thousand dollars of donated auction items i you you could probably argue that that is a not a material item to actually segregate out and we could have that discussion of whether or not it may make sense to pull out so there are some definitely as in in auditing in general, we definitely apply materiality. Under the, the rules itself, you should be doing it, but there are things I think that are too small to, to worry about. The next topic I wanted to talk just a little bit about is the lease standard. Mostly I wanted to make everyone aware that it exists, that it's actually coming and pretty imminent. Um, as you can see, it, it's a, been a long time coming. This is probably one of the standards that's had the longest runway. It was initial, like the initial exposure draft was released back in 2010. And as you can see from the title, it, this standard was actually released in 2016. Um, and it is effective, first effective for 2022 um, calendar years. So, uh, those I, um, those years starting 
this after December 30 or after December 15th, 2021. So the 2022 calendar year is going to be the first time this is has to be implemented. And why it's so it's imminent because we're coming up on 2022. And I think it's a good idea to have something in place during the year to be recording it correctly during the year. But one at bottom line is essentially all leases are going to be on the balance sheet, which means you're going to have a right of use asset and a big old liability for the present value of your future lease payments that you have starting on January 1st, 2022. If you have, if you, if this is applicable and so remember, donated rent is not included in the standard. So if you have free rent, you will, you will apply other gap uh, under contributions. It doesn't, this, uh, this standard is not applicable, but I would really consider looking at some different software options to implement this. It's a relatively complicated calculation. There's a lot of different things you have to put in place. If you have a modification to your lease, you have to freeze your lease and then, and you have to have a discount rate included. You have to disclose a lot of things. There's a lot of good softwares out there that can help you make this a lot easier and a lot less um, problematic. Because for those of you that decide to use an Excel spreadsheet and do an amortization table, it's gonna be a little bit harder for us to audit um, versus if you're using a, a software Internally, we were using Lease Crunch. Um, if you need information, I'd be happy to provide you some information. You can get a demo of it. Um, it's about $100 a year per lease uh, with a $500 minimum. So if you only have a few, it, it's, it's a pretty inexpensive way to implement the new standard and meet the standards and get yourself going in the right direction. And the next slide just shows you a little example of on the balance sheet, some of the line items that you're going to start seeing uh, that we haven't seen in the past, these right of use assets, as you can see there, financing and operating still exist and you still have to break them out and those will be current and long term. So you do have to, if you present a classified balance sheet or statement of financial position, you have to break those out. Um, the next slide is just an example of what the foot or the journal entries look like from lease crunch and as you can see i just kind of put in a fake lease that was entered into in august with a 2500 dollars payment requirement that escalated slightly over the next 10 years and as you can see it created a three hundred thousand dollar asset so not even rents that are not even very significant can create some pretty significant balance sheet implications and as you can see the even though the cash is twenty five hundred dollars you're rent expense is not $2,500 because you have to be on straight line over the entire life of the lease. And the next two slides just briefly wanted to show you how it's, there's a lot of disclosures and it's, there's a lot of calculations, weighted average of discount rates, rated average of remaining useful lives. The next slide has the current maturities of of the liabilities. So a lot goes into the standard and it wants you to at least know it exists and know that we have to do something about it and start getting your leases accumulated, getting an inventory and figuring out how you're gonna implement this new standard. Two other standards that I just wanted to mention, they're not probably as significant to a lot of organizations, but good to know that they exist. This first one specifically is around cloud-based arrangements. Softwares these days are all going to cloud-based, um, even though you still have to have an implementation cost. It can be kind of hefty to get it customized and get it figured out. Under current gap, because of the way things, um, be, the, under current gap, you would expense that huge implementation cost because you can't take that cloud-based software to your own server. And that's the way that the current gap is written. Obviously, the world is changing. We are in a very virtual world now, especially because of COVID-19. Everybody wants to go to cloud-based to, to keep everything and everybody running. This new standard, which can be early adopted, and I have had clients early adopt it because they put in some new ERP systems. Those 
big amounts that you have to pay up front for implementation can now be capitalized and amortized over the life of that contract, which is usually somewhere around five to seven, five to 10 years. And the last standard, again, more of an FYI, um, for those of you that have any kind of debt agreement or a LIBOR or a, a line of credit agreement, LIBOR is expected to go away. It is in the process of being um, discontinued and not being used anymore. Many debt agreements that we see in the audit practice have a variable rate and are connected to LIBOR. Obviously right now your late rate is probably pretty low, which is amazing. Um, but under the current guidance, if, if the LIBOR were to go away and they replaced it with a new, a new rate of um, the newest, uh, what most are probably going to replace it with is called SOFR, S-O-F-R, which is the secured overnight financing rate. That's considered a contract modification. And under current GAAP, you would have to go through all the contract modification rules and, and apply all that. As we recognize that that is a big burden and is basically allowing you not, or is allowing you not to have to do that and you can bypass the contract modification rules and just have your new rate and go on as if nothing actually happened. Um, it is a limited use standard though to be um, make sure. So if you do have LIBOR in your agreement, it might be a good idea to reach out to your banker, find out what they're doing internally, how they're handling it and when they will be either redrafting or um, providing any kind of amendment on that because it's only available to use currently um, until December 31st, 2022. That was the prepared information I have. I see we have some questions. So Emily, have you looked through those? And yeah. um, so I can answer one of them. It looks like most, most are for you, but one question came in and asking if there are any changes for religious nonprofits, which are currently exempt from Form 990. No changes to that yet. Doesn't mean there won't be. Um, it is still optional for churches and so and religious organizations. You may choose to do so. And you may ask, why would I do that if I don't have to? 990s really provide transparency. It could encourage more donations if people are able to look on there and see where their donations are going. It could also maybe protect against just some of the, some negative attention in, in a world where people question where funds are used. 990s do report that for the public. So no changes yet, but always keeping an eye on that. All right. Uh, another question that came in is, are all forgiven rents considered contributions? Yes, they are. Um, you, we should, the, the standard that normally happens, especially if there's an actual lease agreement in place, is at the time that you sign the lease agreement and at the time you receive that, we need to, um, we need to pr uh, calculate the present value of all the future lease payments based on the current market and record a huge contribution at that date. And then you also record a promise to give on the balance sheet that then falls off over the, the life of the lease agreement. Uh, another question on the software, the cloud computing ASU came up is, does this re also refer to software agreements? It, that standard is relevant to all software agreements um, if, if it falls within the parameters of of the ASU. It's not just accounting software, it's not just sales, but like Salesforce, um, ERP systems, those are just great examples. But if you have other softwares, uh, engineering firms or construction firms have different project management softwares. If those have significant implementation costs, especially to, to get them uh, very specific to what your needs are, and that could be kind of costly, those costs will most likely be uh, included and would be able to be amortized. There are a couple couple rules in there about the um, following, and you basically follow internal use software rules. And I believe I saw one more question, um, just asking about some best practices for tracking restricted contributions. This is a big challenge, I think, for a lot of organizations because contributions can come from everywhere. 
I think it's really important to have a, what I call a net asset roll forward. So anytime you have any contribution that has a restriction of any type, you need to have, it, most of what organizations I see is having it on a, um, an Excel spreadsheet to track it, what the amount is, and then having the purpose behind that. So it's all in one place. Organizations I've, with QuickBooks, I see classes used a lot to track the expense side of things and allocate it out among the classes. If you use classes for your programs and you have more specific restrictions that are not quite following your classes, I've also seen the jobs function used. Um, the old Great Plains had some great off, um, abilities in them to track restrictions as well. When you put in your, you could have allocations set up for, especially your salaried people, you could have a set allocation that their salary would, it would automatically, same with your rent, that could automatically get um, allocated out. But definitely having like at least at, at a minimum an Excel spreadsheet that has all of your restricted contributions in them. I haven't seen if uh, Salesforce and Blackbaud, they those are also you know fundraise. They're very much fundraising and donor tracking softwares. We haven't seen. I honestly haven't seen great grant great restriction contribution tracking software out there as of right now, but. There, if there's any other questions, I think we got them all. I know Byron has a little bit of uh, housekeeping to to do, and we're at you know we only have a couple minutes left. Great. Well, thank you, Emily and Nicole. That was great. Very good job. Uh, it was informative. We recorded this, and it'll be posted on our YouTube channel, PCAS YouTube channel, but. If you just listen to that, it's not going to, unfortunately, going to provide you with CPE credits. But if there's some information you need to see on here, you want to want to review again, then that will be available to you on our YouTube channel. At the end of this uh, webinar, you're going to get a pop up for an evaluation. Please give us your feedback. We appreciate hearing from everyone. And also let us know if there's other topics that you would like for us to cover. Uh, we, we're happy to do so, happy to provide better, more information. You've got Emily and Nicole's email here. If, uh, if there's anything that uh, we can help you with, we're happy to do so. And my name is Byron Abair. I'm the Chief Growth Officer of the firm. We're happy to reach out to me as well if we can, if we can provide any, any, uh, any service to you. So, all right. Well, thank you, everybody. This is great. I uh, hope you have a great rest of your day. And uh, we look forward to seeing y'all again. And like Emily said, hopefully next time we can do this in person. We look forward to seeing everybody in person. And All we're right, targeting November for the next um, oh, for the next seminar. So be on the lookout Perfect. for that invite um, in October. Great. Thank you again, Emily and Nicole. Great job. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you for watching this recording of our Zoom webinar. A quick reminder that watching this video will not qualify you for CPE credit. For more information about PKF Texas's upcoming webinars, contact Jay Lemansky at pkftexas.com and stay tuned for future topics.